parent. <laughs> so these are just the, here's me in my wetsuit getting ready to go in the water in the winter. Um, so it's, it's really exciting to live and work in a place where there's so many amazing natural resources. So that's a little bit about me. And now hop over into my presentation here about coastal waterbirds. Um, so this presentation looks like someone might not be on mute. Um, folks can go ahead and mute their microphones. That would be great. Um, so this presentation is about sharing. Um, and oh, looks like I just got another notification about sharing. Uh, well, again, Joan, just let me know if my screen isn't showing up here. It should say protecting shorebirds at Wakoit Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve. And that's um, what I'll be speaking about tonight. Mm -hmm. It says my screen share is paused. Yes, I'm still seeing. There, good. Perfect. Thanks for everyone's patience with some of the the technical glitches, uh, but here are some piping plovers here, hopefully recognizable to some of you. And here's just a brief overview of the presentation this evening. I'll talk a little bit about DCR because the relationship that DCR has with Mass Audubon's Coastal Waterbird Program is, is very significant and has been a very powerful partnership over the years. But I'll also talk a little bit about the Coastal Waterbird Program and the tools that we use for protecting shorebirds. I'll talk a little bit about the protected species in Massachusetts. Hopefully some of them are, are familiar, the usual suspects. Um, so we will revisit those and I'm gonna try and hide this in case you can see that, great. Um, and I'll also give some updates on South Cape Beach and Washburn Island, which are the two main sites that the Coastal Waterbird Program monitors within Webner. Briefly, uh, just to check in about the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation. So many of you probably know this uh, because you might be familiar with Webner, maybe you're familiar with DCR sites, but it just bears repeating that how much land that DCR manages across the state, um, many state parks and over 450,000 acres across Massachusetts. And what it's doing at these sites is really protecting and promoting the state's natural, cultural and recreational resources. Jorge, our partner and the DCR coastal ecologist was unable to be here tonight. So I wanted to just uh, give a little context on the work there because many of these sites are coastal habitat where DCR is protecting these nesting shorebirds. And many of them are also monitored by the coastal waterbird program as part of DCR's work. So if folks are curious, there's some sites that DCR monitors like Revere Beach is a really great example um, up, in, up in Boston. And there are some sites that the Mass Audubon Coastal Waterbird Program monitors and Webner um, sites are a really good example of that. If you're not familiar with the Coastal Waterbird Program, one fun fact is that coastal waterbirds and their protection was really part of the impetus for the, the beginning of Mass Audubon years and years ago, back in the 1880s. And this is because so many birds were being used to make hats in the millinery trade because some of the birds we'll talk about today have these beautiful feathers. And so folks were noticing that there were a lot of feathers on these hats and concerns sort of began to arise. Um, and again, this is a big part of the legacy of Mass Audubon. The current logo of Mass Audubon, if you can see on the lower right hand side of my screen is actually a rosy turn. Um, so an, another seabird that's uh, of a lot of significance and is endangered in the state of Massachusetts. But the current Coastal Waterbird Program was formalized in the 1980s when the piping plover was listed. There are two main goals of the program that encompass quite a few other um, topics under, the, under that umbrella and, and methods under this umbrella, but here they are, protecting rare coastal birds and their habitats and conserving Massachusetts coastal ecosystems through science-based management. And so many of you might know that it's not just about a single bird. It's not just about protecting you know, one nest, although that really matters to the program, but it's really the entire habitat that these birds rely on and understanding the different patterns at these sites, the threats to these birds, as well as the biological data from these birds. So these are our two main goals. And we accomplish this in four key ways. Again, there's lots of um, methods that fall underneath these umbrellas, but the first is on the ground management things like setting up fencing and signage, which you might have seen, doing training and outreach, so interacting with folks on the beach and providing education, as well as training our own seasonal staff, working to further public policy that supports coastal conservation and nesting shorebirds, and engaging in conservation science. And that can mean anything from doing research on what birds are eating, 
to collecting data on restoration and different patterns in, in bird movement. So these are sort of the, the, the foundation, the core foundation of the Coastal Waterbirds program work. Here are those familiar suspects or usual suspects that I mentioned earlier. On the left-hand side of the screen, there's a couple images of piping plover as well as a what looks like a cotton, cotton ball um, on toothpicks in the lower left-hand corner is the piping plover chick. We have the rosia tern in the uh, top center image, and you can see that looks very much like the Mass Audubon logo. On the right-hand side of the screen are some least tern, and on the bottom of the screen are American oyster catcher, which are birds with these very long red beaks. They're very striking, and they're a lot larger than some of the other birds. So we'll, we'll check in about these species individually, but I just wanted to put them all collectively in, in one spot. You might know that these birds in some ways have the odds stacked against them. There are so many challenges that coastal birds face on our coast, whether they're natural or human related. Um, this could be anything from driving on a beach to fireworks, um, to unintentional disturbance from dogs who you know, may or may not be allowed to be there at that time when shorebirds are nesting. Predators pose a very serious threat like coyotes and American crow and large storms. There's some there's sort of a caveat with storms, which I'll mention in a moment it's in, about piping plovers in particular. But when we see these really big storms last year, we had this hurricane that happened or a tropical storm that happened in July. And we had a nor'easter on Memorial Day. And these kinds of storms uh, can have a negative impact on our coastal birds nesting success. Can you put it somewhere I can see it too? Mm -hmm. Luckily, uh, we have a lot of management tools to support these threatened species. And this slide just shows a couple. We have fencing, we have educational signage. In some places, um, on occasion, we will use electric fencing, which is, again, to protect from predators. And yeah. we use something called exclosures in some locations, which are sort of a, a protective cage that you place over a piping clover nest so that the piping clover and the chicks can come in and out but so the nest itself is protected. Um, so there's lots of tools available at our disposal to try and support these, these birds when they're here to breed during the breeding season. You may have seen some signage on beaches across the state when you're enjoying beaches between April and August. We have quite a catalog of signs and the hope is that we're, we're really addressing certain issues at different sites, so whether it might be dogs or maybe there's a certain species using the site. So the hope is that it's educational. And the other piece uh, that folks might not know is that it's always a goal to protect early. There's a lot of data that supports the, the idea that earlier nests tend to have more success. All of these species will re-nest if they don't succeed the first time around. And so the earlier we can protect this habitat and support birds as they're trying to nest, the higher the likelihood is that they will succeed. Um, so that's one piece. Sometimes people ask, why is there fencing up so early? It's only, it's only the end of March. Um, and that's really to protect that early nesting activity. Oftentimes with our fencing, we're also protecting habitat for all of our focal species with one fence. So there might be a place where oyster catchers and terns and clovers are nesting together. And that's, that's really great because we're accomplishing a lot with just one large fence. And I also want to acknowledge AmeriCorps uh, Cape Cod AmeriCorps has played a, a huge role in fencing with the Coastal Waterbird Program um, over many years, including at Webner. They're, they're really part of a team that helps get out there when it's cold and windy like it was today early in the season to get that symbolic fencing up on the beach. The Coastal Waterbird Program also, as I mentioned earlier, is, is dedicated to moving policy forward that supports nesting and supports coastal habitat. And this is primarily focused on disturbance, disturbance management. Um, and this could mean anything from helping understand when a beach should be closed to vehicles because there's nesting or staging activity. It might be new outreach initiatives or programs that are being developed. It could be different monitoring approaches and really assessing how birds are using a site. And so this is a lot broader than our immediate on the ground management. This is big picture. How can we support all different kinds of stakeholders across the state? Because Massachusetts is so important for these species. I would also say that the Coastal Waterbird Program is very interested in advocating for green solutions on our coastline. There's a lot of erosion happening these days. 
Um, and the hope is that restoration projects, things like dredging, uh, this is an example of an island actually here in Barnstable where there's a, a very significant restoration that took place. And you can see just how much more habitat is on that beach for, for our coastal birds. But also you, can, you might think or, or note that the resiliency of that island, those dunes are far more resilient now after the restoration. So that's just another piece um, that's a little bit, again, distant from that immediate day in day out effort but it's, it's looking at the bigger picture and thinking about how we can protect habitat across the state. We're very proud of all the folks who have come through our program. At this point, um, it's probably close to about 1500 scientists and wildlife managers that have been part of the Coastal Water Bird Program as interns or staff. And now these folks are spread out all across the country and other places doing great conservation work. So it's, this is another cornerstone of our program is it takes a village, it takes a big seasonal staff just to cover all of the sites that we monitor in the state. Again, doing outreach and some of you have been part of this in the past, it sounds like. So educating folks um, and really fostering these partnerships. DCR is a great example of a partnership that the Coastal Waterbird Program has, but we also work with towns, private landowners, other conservation organizations and state and federal agencies. So again, we're all sort of in it together. Uh, these birds wanna be on the beaches the same time as humans do. And so the more education and outreach we can provide and the more partners we have, the more likely it is that we'll be able to protect these habitats. And of course, training and outreach. So it's not only about us coming in and doing the work, it's how can we expand that capacity, that conservation capacity in local communities? So how are we involving folks? How are we sharing our work? How are we um, really bringing folks into the effort rather than it just being something that we're, we're coming in and completing? And so that's another big goal of the program. Shifting a little bit over to our species, this of course is the piping plover. It's a small sand colored shorebird that nests on an open beach. And I always joke that this bird's superpower is its camouflage. It's very difficult to see um, unless you're a seasoned birder, someone that's seen one before or has been trained. Um, the, the adults, the chicks, the eggs are all very well camouflaged. And again, they nest right on open beach. So this is a source of a lot of confusion with folks that are new to these birds is that they're not nesting in trees. They're not in back in the grass. They're not in, in the rose bushes, right? They're right on the open sand, right on the ground, which makes them highly, highly vulnerable to human disturbance. They're listed as threatened under the federal and state endangered species act. And fun fact, Massachusetts at this time supports even over 40% of the Atlantic coast population. We're closer to 50%. So that means 50% of the piping plovers that use the Atlantic coast to nest are using Massachusetts. So here in Massachusetts, we're very excited about that, but it's also a very big responsibility. Uh, looking at the map on the right-hand side here, you can see there's a nice big blue blob in the Great Plains um, out in the interior of the, the US as well as the Great Lakes. And the Great Lakes population is very small and that population is actually endangered. I always say these birds are very smart because when the weather starts to turn here in New England, they hightail it down to the Caribbean, the Bahamas, to, to warmer shores to overwinter. Um, so they're sort of like snowbirds in that way. Piping plover are really a species that is dependent and relies upon these really dramatic coastal dynamics that we see over the winter here. Um, if any of you spend time on the coast during the winter, you might know that there are big storms, all this vegetation is scoured, there are new channels that are created, there's this washover of the tides, and who would know it, that, that creates ideal nesting habitat for piping plover. Climate change and sea level rise are another sort of complicating factor that I'm not including so much in this because that might mean net habitat loss. But really when we're looking at the typical storms that we're seeing, this is, this is brilliant. Piping plover prefer about 20% vegetated habitat. So they love that sparsely vegetated area. Um, and so when we, we see the habitat changing, oftentimes that's a good thing for piping plover. Again, these birds are so well camouflaged. Uh, they nest in a very shallow scrape in the ground, which adults create by kicking their legs and rocking back and forth. And every single one of these scrapes, as we call them, is a nest that's protected by those Endangered Species Act. So even if there are no eggs yet, um, these scrapes are protected. And that's another fun fact to share with people. You can think of it in a way that adults are creating many, many nests, and then they're selecting one to lay eggs in, but all of them are protected. Once these chicks hatch, they can move from the nest within hours. 
of hatching. And that's because they're precocial, which means they're responsible for feeding themselves. It's very different than other birds. If you could think about a robin in your backyard uh, being fed by its, by its parents um, and they're giving it worms or things like that. These chicks are up, they need to get to the water, they need to be in the intertidal zone. Um, chicks can move over half a mile on the first day of life, which is pretty remarkable considering their size. And they fledge or learn how to fly in approximately 25 to 35 days. Now, that's a little bit of an interesting thing to think about because it's very variable. And here at the Coastal Waterbird Program, we really wanna see that sustained flight before we're calling a bird fledged. But it can take a lot longer if there's problems with the food source or birds are very highly disturbed. It can extend it even to 50 days. It could take 50 days for these tiny chicks on the left to grow into these beautiful fledged juveniles on the right. Popping briefly over into least turn land, the, of course, the, the focus of this presentation is plovers, but it's always great to check in about other species that are using Webner and using these habitats. Uh, least turn are small seabird species with sort of a black laurel stripe or a Zorro stripe, and they also nest on open beach. Um, they're called seabirds really because they spend more of their time at sea than they do on land. So they're a little bit different than our, our shorebird comrades. Uh, there are species of special concern in Massachusetts, which means, again, that they're afforded those same protections under the Endangered Species Act. So even though they're not listed as threatened or endangered, they're still protected by that fencing, their scrapes are still protected. And that's a question we get a lot is, is there, you know, is there a difference in the protections? And the answers for management is no, there, there isn't. So there, there are species that, again, folks are very concerned about here in Massachusetts. And there's about 40,000 pairs on the Atlantic coast. Again, these birds are smart. They don't want those New England winters. They are journeying down to South America and the Caribbean uh, during the off season to winter. These are a little bit of a trickier species to understand how their population is changing and growing um, or declining because they live a very long time. They can live up to 24 years old, which is pretty old for a bird. So if the same adults are coming back year after year, it might be hard to detect changes in that population. Um, but right now, actually, it seems like Lucerne are doing better than a lot of folks thought that they were because they can be a little bit hard to decipher. Again, they nest in those shallow scrapes on the ground, but they're colonial nesters. And that means they nest in big groups. And you might have taken a stroll along a beach at some point and had adults diving at you. They're very defensive when it comes to their nests and young. And usually that means give them distance, right? You're, you're in their space, you're frightening them. Um, they're, they're trying to protect their nesting habitat. So that's a really great, great way to know, okay, I'm too close, it's time for me to back up. Colonial species like least tern adapt and respond very quickly to changes in their habitat. And that can mean shifting an entire colony to a new site because there was a big storm that overwashed or the disturbance is too significant. Um, and like our other species, they, they can re-nest up many times if they're not successful. So again, we really want those earlier nests to succeed. So that's just a little bit about these beautiful waste turn. And last but certainly not least, the American oyster catcher. This is a very striking shorebird. Um, I think folks are always excited to see them. They have a very distinct call that sounds like they're yelling, wee, going down a, a slide or something like that. Um, there's about 11,000 of them in the breeding population, and there's not as many in Massachusetts. It's a, a little bit over 200 birds in Massachusetts. Uh, they are not protected under those endangered species laws I mentioned earlier, but they are on the state wildlife action plan and the state of the bird watch list. So they are species of conservation concern in Massachusetts, and part of that is just really trying to understand what, what those dynamics are. How are they moving north? Um, you know, can we expect these populations to increase? They, they've been somewhat static uh, over the past couple of years. And really their bread and butter is the Southeast uh, and the Mid-Atlantic. So we're, we're close to the Northern end of this bird's range, uh, although they have been spotted on some islands in Maine. So they're, they're sneaking up there a little bit. And again, you may have guessed it. They nest in scrapes. Theirs are bigger because they're a bigger bird. And the one thing I would say about oyster catcher is that they're very, very skittish. By the time you see an oyster catcher during nesting season, it's likely that they're already spooked off their nest. They see humans coming from a mile away. And that's really challenging because we want them to stay on the nest, right? We want birds to be incubating so those chicks can hatch successfully. We want them to be able to feed their young without disturbance. Um, but again, they're, they're very elusive and those chicks uh, will be hiding. So they're a challenging bird to monitor and also to, to protect from human disturbance. But the adults will certainly make a scene. Um, if, if you are close to their nest or chicks, they'll try and pull you away. And this is something that all of these birds have in common as well. We talked a little bit about least turn and how they might 
dive at you. But plovers will do a broken wing display, which is rather upsetting. But again, it's telling you you're too close, right? You're, you're close to my young, you're close to my nest. And I want to, I want to lead you away and take you away from this area. So really all these birds are very, very good parents. I'm always impressed by, by uh, just how dedicated they are uh, when it comes to protecting chicks and their nests. This graph shows the changes in abundance and productivity of piping plovers over the last 35 years. So quite an impressive time scale. And the blue bars here show the numbers of pairs in the state. So at a quick glance, you'd say, wow, those numbers are going up. That's great. But then if you look at this red line, sort of jagged red line, this is showing the number of birds that fledge per pair. And that means again, the number of birds per pair that are joining that reproductive population that are contributing to the population. And so we really want that number up. We want, it, we want that red line to be nice and high because we, that means nesting is successful. The number that the agencies use now is 1.24. That's really what we're aiming for. And that will be important in a moment when we look at the numbers for Washburn and South Beach, uh, South Cape Beach over at Webner. Um, but you see, it's a little variable. Last year, there were a lot of really intense storms. So you can see that it dipped a little bit down to one. Um, so here at the Coastal Waterbird Program and other shorebird monitoring organizations, it's always how can we keep that number up and keep it sustainable because we really want to see those birds fledging. Here is a little simple satellite image of Webner. South Cape Beach is here on the east or on the right-hand side of the map. And then of course, Washburn Island is on the left-hand side. And this is, as many of you may have guessed, a very important place for shorebirds and seabirds, not only the ones that I've mentioned today, um, but, but many other species as well. And there's a, there's a few reasons for that. Thinking about, oops, if there's somebody on, um, who is not mute, if you go ahead and mute, that would be great. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, so just checking in about some of the, the key habitat features for shorebirds that are immediately apparent here at Webner. There's open sandy beaches, which is ideal nesting habitat. There's a very plentiful rack line, and that's really where plovers spend their time foraging for, for invertebrates. There's salt marsh habitat, which again is prime foraging uh, for both seabirds and shorebirds. There's beach grass areas, and it's much more sparse down on the beach for shelter, particularly for chicks. Um, they like to be protected from weather and sun, things like that. There's some ephemeral pools, which again, these birds are all about food. <laughs> They're gonna eat, 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 and so are their chicks. And the other key feature is having access to both a bay side and an ocean side. Um, plovers in particular really love having the choice. They're, they're picky. It's, they have that quiet water on the bay side and then the more dramatic water on the ocean side. There has been some really great research done showing that plovers here up in Massachusetts don't always need the bayside. Um, that's more of a mid-Atlantic uh, sort of tri-state plover preference, which I found really interesting. But long story short, um, it's, it's great for them to have options, especially if they're being disturbed to really have that, this broad habitat to choose from. Here's a quick, simple graph about uh, piping clover productivity on Washburn Island um, since 2015. Now, don't be alarmed. Looking at the number of pairs, you can see that there was a nice increase in 2017. And then the pairs have stayed a little static for the past couple of years. That's that golden line. And if you look at the fledged per pair number, 2018 was not a great year. But again, keeping in mind that 1.24 number that we're hoping for, you can see that that sort of teal green line pretty much stays in that zone. Um, we had a couple of great years, 2019 and 2020 were, were really exciting. Um, so even though it, it might seem like, wow, there was that big drop, you have to keep in mind that we're looking for that sustainable number and we're looking for pairs that are coming back to the site. So not, not too shabby at Washburn. South Cape Beach is a little bit different. The birds are struggling a little bit more at South Cape and I'll talk about that. Um, but looking at the number of pairs, again, we had a peak around 2017, a little bit of a decline. Again, the number of piping plover is that golden line. And then there was a little bit of a rebound in pairs in 2021, but the fledging success has not been as great. If you can look at that green line, you'll see in 2016, um, there was a nice little peak, but for the most part, we're really hovering around one or below. Um, chicks fledged per pair. And I think that there's two things about this. It's, it's great to know that we still have work to do um, and that's, that's really inspiring. And we've also seen all of the methods that we've used be really successful. So uh, don't despair, but uh, Southgate Beach has some challenges, which I'm hoping to share with all of you. One thing we see a lot that threatens nests and chicks at Webner sites 
is beach visitors cutting through the fencing. <laughs> and understandably, folks are looking for the path of least resistance to get to the beautiful beach. So no, no shame in that. But we're really hoping to continue to educate folks and let them know that only qualified shorebird monitors are committed to the fencing. And that's really to limit takes and, and negative things, negative impacts on the nesting birds inside the fenced area. You might also know that South Cape and Washburn are great wildlife habitat. This is a huge testament to, to DCR and, and the great management. So there's a diverse suite of predators uh, that really get excited about piping plover eggs like coyotes. Um, dogs, of course, as we, we spoke about briefly before, pose a serious risk to nesting shorebirds. Um, even friendly, wonderful dogs can scare shorebirds so much that they abandon nests, they abandon young. Um, and dogs, of course, can unintentionally injure or kill birds. So we really are working to do as much outreach as we can to share with people why, why there are these dog rules in place. And, and oftentimes dog rules are really about human safety and shorebirds are sort of secondary, but it's still a great way to, to educate folks and let them know um, why those rules are there. Kites and windsurfers, if you're a windsurfer enthusiast, that's amazing. It seems like a very difficult sport, <laughs> however, these big structures like kites and windsurfers look like predators to nesting shorebirds. So again, we're, we worry about abandonment. We worry about them leaving and trying to defend their nest against something. So there's actually guidelines in place that ask for these to be quite a distance away, 200 meters, um, in order to reduce disturbance to nesting shorebirds. And last, um, last of all, weather and overwash events. It really depends on the year. Um, if you're someone who's from a coastal place, you know that some years tend to be more mild, and then some year we have some years we have these storms in the middle of the of the springtime or late spring in the middle of the summer. And one year we had a tornado in, in Harwich a couple of years ago. There was a tornado at the end of the season. New England weather. What are you going to do? <laughs> um, but again, things like that have a, have a big impact on these very vulnerable chicks who are just just hatched. Um, so that that can have a negative impact as well. Checking in on oyster catchers, I just want to share, this is a species that we can see at Washburn. Um, if they fail at Washburn, which does happen sometimes, they'll move to South Cape Beach. We do see one or two pairs regularly returning. In fact, for a couple of years, it was the same pairs because they were banded. So we knew uh, they have a little bracelet on them, for lack of a better way to say it. And we know it's the same bird coming back year after year. Um, and again, I can't stress enough how sensitive these birds are to human activity. They really, by the time you see them, they're already disturbed and no matter if you try and sneak up on them or not. So it's great to know that these are around in this, in this ecosystem. And least terns, again, least terns nest at Washburn and South Cape Beach, but it's really highly variable. Their success, um, it, it has varies over the years and again, can be impacted by human and dog disturbance. Um, and predators, and it's just something for us to be aware of is how can we protect that habitat and how can we limit the disturbance to these species that are so sensitive to it. I included this, this funny little phrase here, birds do not stay in the fencing, because this is a big misconception and maybe all of you know that. They think that we have this nice fancy professional fencing up. Those birds know to stay in the fencing, if only they knew to stay in the fencing. Uh, they don't, right? They move out, they come out to forage, they might uh, the chicks, especially loose turns, slowly kind of, they might sort of bask in the sun and make their way out of the fencing. Clover chicks are running everywhere. Oyster catcher chicks are on the move. So that fencing is there to protect them and give them refuge, but it doesn't mean that they're not all over the beach. So always good to remember that they do not stay in the fencing. But um, again, Despite all of these challenges, it's really remarkable how much water bird protection has been successful here in Massachusetts. And that's because of so many partners and, and so many folks working really hard over the last 35 years to recover these populations. Um, piping plovers have increased nearly six times from what they were in the 80s to almost a thousand pairs. American oyster catchers have increased from just a handful of pairs um, before 1980 to over 200 pairs and least turn populations have increased three times to more than 5,000 pairs in the state. So what's really exciting is that we're seeing success, we're learning more about what works, and these are all adaptive efforts. And so that's why partnerships like DCR, the Coastal Waterbird Program, and all these other folks in the state doing this work are so important so that we can share information and really share efforts uh, to protect these species that are so reliant on coastal habitats. Um, they need these places to survive. They can't nest in your backyard. They can't nest on a pond, you know, they need the habitat here in places like Webner to succeed. So just to finish up, many of you might know these, but I always like to share what folks can do to help. 
Um, even if you're not a shorebird monitor or a volunteer, there are so many ways that you can support these birds um, in their, the limited time they have to breed and have chicks and fly south. And the first is really knowing your local beach rules. There are so many great rules at Webner and beyond about dogs, vehicles, uh, fires, bonfires, things like that. So knowing them and following them is really important. Um, even well-behaved dogs um, can injure shorebirds or force them to abandon nests and young. So really knowing those dog rules and finding all the other great places on Cape to take your dog um, or across Massachusetts to take your dog that isn't the beach during the nesting season. Um, keeping kites away from symbolic fencing or shorebirds and staying out of those fenced areas. Those signs are there for a reason. So encouraging folks to read the signs. I know sometimes we're out there just enjoying our beach day and the last thing we wanna do is read a sign. Um, but there's so much great information, especially at Webner. There's some beautiful panels there that explain uh, the birds and what they're doing and, and what to look out for. And of course, give birds their space when they're foraging and moving around the beach. We don't want to crowd them or push them or you know, get them in a certain area of the beach so they're out of our way. All of that is actually not permitted under the Endangered Species Act. And don't worry, I've got even more. Um, removing your trash when you leave the beach. We have so many wily predators here on here in Massachusetts and really across the whole Atlantic seaboard. Um, predators are attracted to anything you leave behind. Uh, foxes and coyotes, they wanna sniff the, the old chips bag or the sandwich wrapper. So getting those off the beach, sharing all of the information that, that you know or that you learn with friends and family. I, it's amazing what folks know and don't know. As I said, you know, I grew up in Massachusetts and I had no idea. <laughs> so it, it's just that little bit of information can make the difference for, for any nest or any chick. Um, if you see those unpermitted activities taking place on the beach, don't be shy. Notify that local beach manager. Uh, let the lifeguard know. Let, let the gate person know. Sometimes they can be the first line of, of defense and, and helping protect these birds. If you're a photographer, we recommend avoiding photographing nests and chicks. We have some very smart predators again, and crows and corvid species have been observed to literally key in on what your zoom lens is looking at and then come back later for, for their lunch or their snack. So it sounds sort of sad, but we definitely don't wanna be keying in predators. So photographers really wanna keep, keep their distance um, and change what, you're, what you have your camera on and, and don't photograph nests because again, that can attract predators. Um, Mass Audubon staff are joining us right now. This is the time of year. So if you see us out there, come up and ask questions. As you can hopefully tell by this presentation, we love talking about birds and coastal habitats and all the work we're doing. And we can provide specific information about what's going on on the beach. Maybe a nest has just hatched. Maybe there's another cool bird around. So, so don't be shy. Uh, please come up and talk. And Mass Audubon and DCR have lots of programs and newsletters that are there uh, to provide, again, updates and more information and learning opportunities. Um, because the more folks that know about these efforts, the, the better. Um, and the better we can all work as a team to help protect them. The last thing I'll say before um, we, we answer some questions, hopefully, is I just wanna share that you never really know who can be the best advocate for shorebirds. Uh, this image shows a, a fenced area. So there's this big empty swath of beach here, and that's a fenced off area where there was a piping clover nest. And these folks here on the left wearing the hats, they're not shorebird monitors. Uh, they weren't volunteers, but they noticed that these chicks we're having trouble getting back and forth to the water in such a, a crowded day. And so they made it the mission of the day to help these chicks get back and forth to the water. They were asking folks to give them space. They were, you know, sharing information. They were sort of just guiding them because they got excited, right? They saw the birds. They understood how vulnerable they are. These tiny little chicks running around. And so there are all sorts of these, these champions everywhere um, at organizations that do this work, but beyond. So I always like to, to remember that the next person you talk to or share information with, you know, Webner's a great example, could, could make a really big impact. Um, and that's a really powerful thing. And, and the success in shorebird conservation has come this far because of local communities and beachgoers just as much as it's, it's come this far because of organizations. So um, that's all I have, but I would love to answer any questions that folks might have about anything shorebird related or what we're seeing at Webner or uh, anything else. Thank you so much. That was great. And um, so, what we 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 can do now is uh, we will I'll end the recording, and then um, people um, who want to um, oh no, I didn't end the recording. Sorry. 
Um, 